section you want. So while you're standing, open your Bible to Romans chapter 1, if you would. The title of this series through the, the book of Romans is going to be called Truth Be Told, because that's what Paul is doing. I just want to read three verses with you from verse 15 down to verse 16, or verse 17. And when I hit verse 16, would you read it with me, please? That would be great. Paul says this, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Here we go. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those last six words again. The just shall live by faith. Lord, that is music to our ears. And we thank you, Father, for teaching us so clearly in Scripture that we can't fix ourselves. It's, it's you, Lord. Only you have the ability to fix what's broken in us, to save what's lost in us, Lord, and to draw us to you. Even the drawing us to you, Lord, that's your doing. And so we thank you, Father, as we delve into and dive into this book. Teach us in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. How many of you thought, we're never getting into Romans? Well, we, we made it. And uh, how many of you have heard the term magnum opus? Anybody heard the term magnum opus? How many of you thought magnum is just an ice cream bar, the best ice cream bar ever made? How many of you would agree? Magnum is the magnum opus of, uh, of ice cream bars, but really the term means this. It's the work of an artist, a composer, or an author, which is considered to be their defining piece, their, their most important work. Not always their most popular work, but their most important work. And, and I, think, I think that's true. But when, when you're talking about a magnum opus of all these different artists, I, I want to give you a quiz. Now, we're not all going to agree on what the magnum opus is of these different artists, but what would you say in terms of not an individual song, but records, albums, what would you say was Paul Simon's, so far, his magnum opus? Graceland. Somebody said Graceland. I agree. You might disagree with me. That's all right. You don't have to agree with me. You can be wrong if you want to, but what would, what would you say was Michael Angelo's magnum opus? Who said Sistine Chapel? Who said Pieta? Anybody say Pieta? That's the only work that he signed. And they believe because it's the only one he felt was really finished, that there wasn't something else that he could do to take it even further. I mean, but, but come on, the Sistine Chapel, I, I hear, and I've never been there, but I hear that those who go into the Sistine Chapel look at it and say, no way, dude. <laughs> Just incredible, the scope of the work. Um, Tolstoy, what was his magnum opus? War and Peace. What about Hemingway? They say it was Mice and Men. Some would say it was the Grapes of Wrath and other things. What about the Beatles? What was the Beatles' magnum opus? How many said the White Album? I heard some people say the White Album. Yeah, uh, you know what? Alan corrected me. Alan, he's such a nice guy typically, isn't he? He really is. He, he's, he's one of the, he's the, the best associate pastor to work with. He really is. But he, he put this... I'll write over my notes here today. He said, no, no, it's not the White Album. The Beatles' magnum opus is Sgt. Pepper. How many said Sgt. Pepper? All right, case, case dismissed. We're going to throw that one out of court. We'll just let that be what it is. C.S. Lewis, what was his magnum opus? Probably Mere Christianity. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. That's my favorite. But in terms of what he stood for, you find it in, in Mere Christianity. Chuck Smith's, I think his magnum opus was Why Grace Changes Everything. And grace changed his life, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But Tozer, in, in all of his books, I think the knowledge of the holy is the top of the heap and the pursuit of God. Those two, if you haven't read those yet, get them. They're not difficult. They're not long. you got to get those and read them in prayer. What about Bill Watterson? Who knows Bill Watterson? <laughs> Bill Watterson's magnum opus, you've all, you all know Bill Watterson, is the title of the book was Something Under the Bed is Drooling. That's Calvin and Hobbes, by the way, the man who did Calvin and Hobbes. 
That's his magnum opus. No question about it, I think. And, and, and some of my favorite quotes from Bill Watterson are these. That's, there's not enough time. There's not enough time to do all the nothing we all want to do. <laughs> and this one, reality continues to ruin my life. Amen? Anybody else? <laughs> Run in with reality. will change you. But this is great. The surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere is that it has never tried to contact us here. <laughs> that shows that they're smart. And who wants to go there? But if you want to understand an author or uh, an artist, you really need to take a look at their magnum opus. And almost all scholars agree that Paul's magnum opus, that, that, that which really contains everything that Paul was all about, his magnum opus, was the book of Romans. Now, please, please remember this. He, he did not write a mystery when he wrote the book of Romans. Paul wasn't trying to conceal anything. He wasn't trying to make theology harder on anyone. He wasn't trying to be clever. He wasn't trying to impress us with his style or his big words. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he, what we call, what we've divided into 16 chapters, what he was trying to do was to just simply reveal the truth. The big truth in plain words. Now, I did a little math on this the other day. I took the whole text of the book of Romans, and Bethany, if, if you hadn't done that, don't worry about it, I did it. So I, 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 I asked Beth, hey, could you do this for me? And I realized, I can do this. So I took the whole text of the book of Romans, I took out all the numbers, all the chapter numbers, all the, you know, the, the divisions of the, you know, the little, the big, uh, you know, headings that you see between the, the, the verses that weren't there in Paul's letter, just the text. And you know how many words there are in, in my Bible, in the book of Romans? 999, exactly. And so I looked for the center word. I mean, who does that? What, what does, <laughs> well, I did that. And I looked for the center word, which in a sense, you could call it the balancing point. You know where that is? Right at the end of the of, of chapter 8, what we call chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And, and the, the last section, I want to read that to you before we get moving on the first part of the book. And listen to this. Look what you're going to find right smack in the middle. Now, I don't know if Paul did that on purpose, but I think it's providential that right in the middle, the balancing point, here's the words that you read. In chapter 8, look at verse 31. It says, what then shall we say to these things? Everything he said before. If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? How many of you know who brings a charge against God's elect? Oh, yeah, Satan does too, but don't you also? also? Don't you look at yourself in the mirror and say, you jerk, or you loser. You, you condemn yourself. I know I do that too. But Paul says it doesn't matter who it is, who is it that brings a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who's at the right hand of God, who makes intercession also for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is this good stuff or what? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're killed all day long accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are, what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities or powers or things present or things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, that's, that's powerful. And there it is right in the middle, and that's what Paul's making his way to. As he starts in the dark first chapters of Romans. Oh, I, I have to encourage you, please. Read, 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 read it. But sometime between now and maybe next week, find 55 minutes where you can sit down and read it in one sitting. Slowly. If you read it slowly, you'll finish it in about 50 to 55 minutes. Now, you're going to have a hard time, you know, just keeping going because there's some of those verses that are going to grab you and you just want to camp there. But read all the way through it. See, it's so important that you don't put a period where Paul puts a comma. At the end of chapter 1, you don't want to stop at the end of chapter 1. 
because there's something that develops into chapter two, and we'll get into that next week. You just want to read it and let the flow of this beautiful book begin to saturate down into your heart. It will change you if you do that. But just continue to read it. I want you to remember it's going to unveil itself, the truth of God. It's not hidden here. It's revealed here. Also remember this. This isn't just written for theologians of whatever camp. I I know there are certain camps of theologians that say, Romans is ours. Whether they be Calvinists or they're Arminians, they think, oh, our case is proven here and yours is disproven. It's not for any one camp of theologians. It's for every single child of God who wants to know God better. Is that anybody in here? So relax as you read. And open your heart to the truth that you're going to see. Relax. This is not too deep for you. There's nothing impossible here. There's nothing that's over your head if you apply yourself. Now, wait a minute, Pastor Bill. I remember, you Bible readers, I know there's some of you thinking this. I remember Peter said something about Paul's writings and how difficult they are. Yeah, here's what he said. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, in all of his, that's Paul's letters, He speaks in them of of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scripture. He said hard, he didn't say impossible. See, Peter the, the fisherman had to admit that there were some things in Paul's writing that he had to stop and focus on if he was gonna get it. He had to read it Again, he didn't say it was impossible. He just said, it's hard. He said, I had to apply the the gray matter up there and put it on the text and listen. Paul never wrote to make things harder, always wrote to explain things and make it not always simple, but at least attainable. Paul never wrote for monks that were cloistered away away in some monastery. I mean monastery. He never, he never wrote just for those chosen few that were geniuses. He wrote for the rank and file child of God that just wanted to serve God better. So don't be afraid of theology. And make sure that any theology that you grab a hold of, that it works down into the practical level where you live with Christ. Yeah, yeah we, we all are going to have to think more deeply than we typically do as we work our way through the book of Romans together. We're going to need to, what's the word? Focus. Focus. I found an acronym for focus. I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever used this. Here's, I think, a workable acronym for focus, what it means. Follow one course until successful. In other words, dig in here. And the people that focus, whatever you focus on, you're going to get good at it. It's a guarantee in life. You focus on some discipline, you'll get good at it. But if we focus on this one course, we're going to understand it. It will challenge us to focus. Anybody, like, and, and anybody here like me? Focus is what? What? I don't have that app. It just, it's, I, I can't find that app anywhere. I don't know how to do that. And if you put me in a blank room with, with, with no windows and no gadgets and no technology and no phone and no cell service... I can still be distracted somehow. So it's going to be hard at times to focus because most of us have allowed our attention span to diminish. You know what the size of the the basic attention span of the evening television viewer is now? 11 minutes and about 31 seconds. 11 minutes and 31 seconds, and then they give you a commercial break. Because they know you're not going to pay attention much longer. How many of you wish there was a pause button in the movie theater so that you could, you know, run out to the restroom or just take a breath? They, they know that. We have allowed our attention span to shrink, shrink, shrink. So prepare here to focus and do it on your own. Prepare to grow in both the grace. I love how Peter said this. Same, same chapter, same letter. Peter said this. He said, I want you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's theologically grow, and also to relationally grow. Theologically means you're you're getting to know more about Jesus, and you will, but it cannot stop there. If you only know more about God, and it doesn't become relational, you didn't go far enough. The relational growth is where you're you're knowing Jesus more better. I did that on purpose. I just thought it was clever. To know Jesus more better to know him in a way you've never known him before. 
walking with you, really knowing that he's walking with you in the worst times and the most challenging times of your life. The team in, 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 uh, in Vietnam needs to know that right now, that that Jesus that's walking with them, even in times that are difficult, they're going to be coming away from their mission trip like the Romanian missionaries and those that went to, to Haiti and wherever they happened to go with, with Ryan over in Eastern Europe, he came back knowing Jesus more better. He knows him in a way now that maybe he didn't know him in a deeper way that maybe it's, it, maybe it's something that's new and something that's fresh. I don't know, but we're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. You will grow as you know him more, as you know more about him. So when you hit something hard to understand, you got to do what I do. You got to keep on reading it. Go back and read it again. Find another version, read it again. Do your homework, read it in and pray it in. I believe that if we get if we really get Romans, and Romans really gets us, it's going to set us free. Because listen, the truth be told, there is gold from beginning to end of this letter. The gospel is certainly portrayed and it's laid out in every single one of Paul's letters. Here in Ephesians is one of your favorite memory verses, maybe memory passages, where he, he develops this idea that you were dead. You weren't just in bad shape before you got saved. You're dead. That's, everybody agree that's pretty bad. Dead is worse than sick, isn't it? Dead is worse than weak. You were dead in sin. But he raised you up, and you've been saved by his grace, grace through faith. It's not you that saved you. It's him. You can't be saved by your good works. If your faith for salvation, if your hope of being right with God rests on how good you can be, then you're trying to save yourself. And you need to shift that confidence off of you and put it on Christ and what he did for you. That's what he says in, in Ephesians and Galatians. He says it like this, I've been crucified with Christ. He takes us back to the cross. Nevertheless, it's not I that live, but Christ in me. In Corinthians, he waits till chapter 15, and he does it so briefly. He said, the gospel that I preach to you, it will save you if you believe this, that Christ died for you, Christ was buried, Christ rose from the dead. And if your confidence rests on him, that's going to save you. But he didn't go into much deeper content, at least not in that section. In Titus, when Paul writes to one of the pastors, he says, it's the grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared to you. And he says it, read with me, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, or we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Paul put this in every letter, every letter that he wrote. And there's one other one that I want to remind you of. It's not a letter of Paul. It's just a statement of Paul. He's in a prison. The town is Philippi. He's in prison because he won't shut up about Jesus. <laughs> and so he gets locked up. And that night, he and his buddy are chained inside the prison cell. And they're praising God. They're singing beautiful songs to Jesus, I love you. Oh, how I love you. And the, and the prison begins to shake. The prison doors come flinging open. And the warden sees that the doors are open. He assumes, what do prisoners do if the doors open? They're gone. He knows if my prisoners are gone, I am dead. Takes out his sword to thrust it through his belly. And Paul sees in the dim light. He said, no, dude, something like that. He said, don't do it. We're all here still. And the, the warden is dumbfounded. He runs in and, and, and he just, he goes, he cuts to the chase. He says, I want what you have. What do I have to do to be saved? And it's like Paul's on a plane that's going down because the prison's still shaking. He doesn't have three weeks to explain the gospel to him. So he says what you would say, I know, if you were on a plane that's going down, he says to the guy, he says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And, and by the way, would you do that if you're on a plane that's plummeting and you know you care about all those people and you're thinking, I don't know what to say. Practice this with me. Okay, I want to practice it at full volume. Like you're on a plane and it's going down and you're up in front in first class. I don't know how you got those seats, but you're in first class. <laughs> And you want all the peons back in the cattle car to hear this. So let's sing it. Let's say it out loud, really loud, so that you want even the captain to hear this. Let's say it. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Woo! And if the plane levels out, then you got time to keep preaching. But if it doesn't, you've given them the gospel, and you just say, this is how you get saved. You believe on Jesus, it really does come down to just that. But Paul preached the gospel in every letter that he wrote. So in this sense, though, when we open up Romans in the sense of developing the presentation of the gospel, it is far more developed and thorough here 
in Romans than it is in any of the other letters that he wrote. Why? Why did Paul go into such detail in Romans and not as much detail in Ephesians or the little postcards that he wrote? Did he just run out of paper and he didn't have anything to write on? Here's, here's what I believe it all comes down to. Paul wrote his other letters to solve problems. There were churches that were suffering under bad teaching, really bad teaching, lies about God. And he said, no, no, don't allow that to be taught in your church, in your congregation. He wrote to churches over issues of moral compromise that you wouldn't believe were happening blatantly, openly in churches in those days. And Paul says, come on, that doesn't belong in the household of God. He wrote books to encourage individuals, and he wrote letters to pastor his pastors, that he wanted them to be on solid ground. But here's the difference. Paul had been with all of those churches. He'd spent extended time with them, anywhere from a couple of weeks to three years. So when he said the gospel, they had the notes from where Paul taught them the gospel, not just preached it, but taught it to them. They could reference everything that he had said because they sat under him. And they lived with him for some of them, as I said, for up to three years. But Paul had never been to Rome. And so he's writing to strangers. He'd heard about the Jesus movement. He heard that there were believers in Rome. God had started something, and he can't get there as quickly as he would like. You'll see that. And so he grabs the biggest scroll that he can, and I think he writes his magnum opus. And he writes just such a beautiful letter that unfolds all that the gospel is all about. And he gives it to them with that centerpiece of the love of God, the, the, the God that will not let you go. You can't, you can't be separated from his love, the depth and the power of his love. It was written somewhere around 56 AD while Paul is on his third missionary trip, probably at this time heading south. And he's hoping he can get to Rome. He thinks he's on his way to Rome. He will make it to Rome, by the way. But guess what? He won't have to pay a dime to get himself there because he'll go as a prisoner. And Rome will pay the fare to get him there to preach the gospel to Rome in the capital city of the empire. They'll, they'll get him there. They'll make it, he'll make his way at the expense of Rome. And he's so excited by the time he gets there. Of course, he would rather have gone some other way. But God will get him there just like he promised he would. And he sits down to write this beautiful letter. So let's take a look at it from verse 1. We'll kind of move quickly through the opening here. In verses 1 to 6, Paul introduces himself. He says this, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through the prophets, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God. See, Son of Man and Son of God, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul will go deeper into all of these, so we won't spend a lot of time on these at the beginning the, uh, of the letter in the introduction. He says, And through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul says, let me tell you about who I am. You know what he puts on the very beginning of his resume? Bond servant. He's saying, I'm a slave. I'm a slave to Christ, a bond slave. Now, I'm not the kind of slave that has been stolen away from my home, thrown into a slave ship, sailed halfway around the world completely against my will. He said, I'm a bond slave. And what that meant to the people that, that were, were reading Paul's letter, they knew exactly what a bond slave was. It's someone who had served a particular master, maybe to work his way out of debt for a period of time, seven years typically. And at the end of those seven years, he realized, you know what? I have had it better these seven years working for this master, great master, than I ever had on my own. He goes to his master and he said, I want to work for you for the rest of my life. I give you what's left of my life. I will be a faithful servant. Then the next step typically was this. You would walk over to the doorpost, the front door of the house, and the bond slave now would put his ear against the, the edge of the doorpost They'd stretch the earlobe out like that. And then the master would take an awl and a hammer and bam, just punch a hole through that ear and put an earring in that ear. 
that earring was the distinct jewelry or distinct mark of that man's family and his empire, whatever it was, his business. And now you, yes, you were his property, but you were his bond slave. And anyone that would see you wearing that ring in that ear, and I'm not sure I got the right ear there, but anyone that would see that would, would realize you've chosen to be that man's slave. The days of your servitude are over, and now you're serving willingly. Paul said, that's me. Before he gets to anything else about him, then he moves on and he says, yes, I'm a bond slave, but my calling is an apostle. An apostle was just a man who was called to take the message of a master somewhere on behalf of that master. Not to change it. He couldn't open the envelope and, and you know, edit it a little bit, change the grammar. It's just deliver my message faithfully. And in the biblical sense, an apostle was really, it appears to be those who start new works in new places. He said, I'm an, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, sort of to, to plunge into virgin territory and to establish the work of the kingdom someplace new on behalf of this wonderful king of mine. He says what his message is. I'm preaching about the risen Christ. Not a dead man, not a philosopher who gave us a new look on life, but a king who's given us new life. A risen savior who died for our sins and rose again from the dead. He'll, he'll get deep in, in all of this. And then I love how he tells us his fo focus group. He said, let's see, where should I focus? What little group of, of the world's population should I focus on? Okay, Jews and Gentiles, all of them. He said, all nations. I'm ready to take this everywhere. And if Paul had time, he certainly had the energy. If he had the time and the means, he would have traveled the whole earth because he knew it, that this gospel needed to be heard absolutely everywhere. So he says, that's who I am. That's what I'm about. That's who I serve. And then he addresses his envelope in verse 7. And he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to Christians, already saints, but he says, I, this is for all of you to hear. Now, here's the question. Let's just touch on it just a little bit more. How did this Jesus movement get started in Rome? Way on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea? How, who went there to start this business? Well, there's, there's some thoughts on that. And I think there's some, some a real valid opinion that comes right down on Acts chapter 2, and I, I, can't remember, I can't remember what verse it is, but in Acts chapter 2 where it's listing all of the people who were present on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit's poured out on the church. And at that point, the church is just a handful of, of followers that are a little bit afraid of getting busted themselves. But now the Spirit of God pours out on them and they're bold as can be, bold like lions, and they stand up and they speak out in tongues that everybody hears in their own language. And it gives you the list and in the list of people from all over the region, it says, oh, and there were visitors from Rome. And then when the invitation, so to speak, is given, and Paul calls people to believe in Jesus, and the, the multitudes, thousands upon thousands of people who get saved, some of them were most certainly visitors from Rome, who went back to Rome with more than a great falafel recipe now. And more than some postcards from that end of the Mediterranean Sea. They came back with life. And they come to, to, to Rome and they start telling their story. Well, what do they know? Well, they know a little bit. But they don't necessarily know a whole lot. Joy, Joy and I were watching a couple of videos, a couple of YouTube videos on the Jesus movement that we were a part of. That's when we got saved. End of 1970 for me, beginning of 1971 for Joy. And, and so we're looking at these videos or we're, we're looking at some of these people we know. I said, oh, look at them. Wow, look how funny they look way back then. And so did we look funny way back then. But to listen to them give their testimonies, you wouldn't call it articulate. It was basic. It was, and it was full of the ums, uhs, and the like, and you know, like, and it was like, and it was like, and all, and it just was, you know, just like now, but just people who were alive in Jesus saying, you, you know, he changed my life, forgave my sin, I came off a of heroin, and I don't know how that happened, but like, you need him too. And it was just simple. Something started in Rome. There was a Jesus movement, and people of all walks of life were coming alive in Jesus Christ, and maybe that was the very, very first mission church ever planted. Who did it? Apostle didn't do it. No, Jesus did it when he took people like you and I. 
They said, why don't you go there? Why don't you tell him? They found, they found hopeless people that needed the hope that they had found in Jesus Christ. And maybe Aquila and Priscilla had something to do with telling Paul about it. We know they had been in Rome and got kicked out of Rome. They meet Paul in Corinth, and maybe they said, Paul, you will not believe what God's doing in Rome. And he says, oh, I've got to get me some of that. I've got to get there. I can't wait to get there. And he starts making these plans, and it just keeps getting put off and put off as he's trying to get into the capital city to tell them all about Jesus. And so in verse 8 through 14, let's read that and look at the building of Paul's passion to get there, which is basically what this is all about. He said, first of all, he said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken about throughout the whole world. He said, I'm hearing about you now everywhere I go. The Christians in Rome and he says to them, verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making a request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Two things I love about this. Paul said, you are on my prayer list. Can you imagine that Paul had a really long prayer list of all the people he'd reached and all the places he'd been, churches that he'd planted, people that his heart broke over them, people that he, he wished that there were 12 of him so he could just stay in all those places forever. But he prayed for people, he prayed for churches, he prayed for pastors, and now he says, Rome, I put you on my prayer list too. Not just once in a while, I always pray for you. But I love this. He said, in the middle of my prayer, I'm trying to find a way in the will of God to come to you. Now, I do like the idea that he says, I, I want to make sure it's God that wants me to get there. But he said, I keep trying to find a way in the will of God to get there. How many of you have been trying to find a way in the will of God to live in Maui for a long, long time? <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to find a way in the will of God to buy my dream guitar, but it's just beyond my reach. You know, you find, try to find a way in the will of God, but he said, you know what? I'm going to leave that up to God. And eventually, I certainly hope to make it there. And so he goes on. He develops this even further. He says, verse uh, um, 11, Here's why I want to get there. I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He said, to be honest with you, I have as much to gain from being with you as maybe you have from me being with you. I know I've got some things that I can pour into you, but I can't wait to come and sit among you, not just for the potluck. You know, not just for the pizza in Rome, you know, Italian pizza. It's not just so I can get there for your food. I want to be there in the midst of you and fellowship with you and look you in the eyes and see what God has done there. And I can't wait to be encouraged by you. But yeah, I've got some things. I want to build you up in truth and in your most holy faith. He moves on, and I have to move on quickly too. He says this in verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. You know what he's saying there? He's kind of dividing the empire into the barbarians and the civilized. Well, the civilized would have been Rome, and the civilized would have also been Greece, but you go beyond there to the east and, and, and especially to the north, and you're among the barbarians. And I don't know if Paul is saying, I'm kind of stuck with the barbarians right now, you know? And I'm going to keep pouring in there, but I would like to be there among you, but I'm a debtor to both of you, to Jews and Gentiles, to barbarians and wise. It doesn't matter what walk of life. I have good news for you. And so then he says in verse 15, man, it's so powerful. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Now, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. A Greek was another way in, in that region of saying Gentile. If you weren't Jew, you were Gentile. And, and since Greek culture dominated the region, it's just another way of saying you're not living off the same script that the, that the Hebrews are living on. He is Jew and Gentile. He said, I am debtor to all of you, and I'm ready to preach the gospel to all of you because the gospel is the only way any Jew or any Gentile can ever be right with God. He said, there, is, there just isn't any other way. It really boils down to this. You're either trying to save yourself or you're letting Christ save you. There isn't any other way. 
It's, and he's calling you right now. He wants, <laughs> he's, got, he's got your attention. He's got your attention. Listen up to him. So Paul says, I am ready and I'm willing. He said, I can't wait to step in, right in to the heart, the capital of this crumbling empire of Rome who needs Christ. How could Paul say that? How could he be that bold? How could he know that without being there, that what they needed was Christ? Well, he knew that because that's what everyone needs. It's what we all need. Rome was as twisted then as we are now. In every, in every similar way, Rome and Romans needed Christ. Oh, they had tons of religions, tons of gods. Well, just leave them alone. I've told you the story before. When we went to Australia, one of the last people that spoke to us, the night we were sent out from Palm Springs, she came up and she said, have a great mission there in, in Australia, but leave those aboriginal people alone. They've got a wonderful religious system. And I said, this isn't a Christian church. No, Paul would never say, hey, you got a wonderful religious system. I'll just have the pizza and I'll be gone. He brings him Christ because there's no salvation in any religious system. It's only in Christ. So Paul will patiently unfold in this book the gospel for the Romans, the gospel for the Jews, the gospel for every single one of us, and to talk about this incredible power of the gospel truth for just a moment before we close and let you go home. Let me tell you what the book of Romans will do to you. To begin with, it's going to take you apart. It really will. It, 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 will, it will take us apart. It'll show us that we're probably worse off than we thought we were before we come to Christ. It's going to bring us to the cross. And then it's going to put us together. It's going to rest you down on a solid foundation of these pillars of truth. And, but it's not going to stop there. Because the book of Romans is then going to say, now let's go. Therefore, because of all that he's done, now let's go. And let's go love people in his name and preach the gospel in his name. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God in Christ alone. You, you see it unfold. And then we're going to get into detail on this as we go. I don't want to give too much of that away. You'll find it as you read too. But the gospel reveals that our only hope is in Christ and that the just are only right with God through faith. The just find life through faith in Jesus. Now, I hope that that comes as welcome truth to your ears. Because I know there's only two kinds of people in the world. There's saved people and unsaved people. Or saved people and lost people. Put another way. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those who care about being right with God and those who could care less about being right with God, or is it couldn't care less than they care about being right with God? And those who care about being right with God, well, there's only two kinds of those people in the world. Those who are trying to fix themselves and make themselves right and righteous by their own behavior, trusting their own goodness, and those who are trusting Christ. And those who are trusting Christ, His goodness, those are the ones that find the righteousness and the life and the justification that comes through what? Faith in Jesus. And he made it simple for us. So, truth be told today, you will see that you are worse off than you ever believed. Truth be told, you will find out that you are more loved than you, were, you could ever dream. I heard a, 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 a preacher, young preacher, young Baptist preacher. He's not really always a screamer, but he was a screamer this day when I saw him online. And he was dealing with this. He said, does God hate sin? He said, look at the cross. And then he said, does God love sinners? Look at the cross. You're loved beyond measure. And if you're still all bundled up and broken up in your sin, God loves you more than you could ever know. And today, he wants to set you free if you'll let him do that. If you're one of those kinds of people that will say, I'm done trusting me, and I'll rest my confidence down on Christ. We're all born broken. 
all of us come into this life with that same sickness, terminal sickness of sin. I checked to make sure it's true, and it is. Our youngest member on our staff, the most recent member of our staff, is Chase Acuna, who oversees the, uh, the college and career age ministry, and his, his wife, Jessica. But the youngest member of our staff is their six-month-old son. And um, I asked Chase the other day, I said, so have you seen anything of a fallen nature in your six-month-old son? <laughs> he laughed and he said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, it's very apparent at this point in his life, it's all about him. He wants all the attention, and that turns into more obvious evidence of our sin. It's, it's in all of us, but we've been rescued by the blood of Christ, the love and the grace and the mercy of Christ. And I want to ask you this morning, if you haven't done this yet, to use that simple ability, that free will that God has given you, and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, which you can't find anywhere else. It's wrapped up in Jesus. That's the only place that it is. And do it right now and start life justified by his faith. Sins cleansed, washed clean by his faith. Burdens lifted by faith in him and him alone. Let that incredible power of the gospel set you free and let him do it now. Would you pray with me? Hmm. Father, I thank you that you have made salvation. Oh, it's simple for us, Lord. It was excruciating for you. We thank you, God, that you loved us enough that you took the hideous strength of our sin, the weight of our sin, upon you. That you offered your son, Lord, for our sins. Who took it and died and was buried and rose again. And oh God, I thank you for the incredible power of your gospel to set people free, even right now, Lord. And I pray that hearts that maybe have never opened to you before in a focused way would open to you right now, Father, as they hear the offer and the call to surrender to you. There'd be a readiness, Lord, a quick readiness to open their hearts and allow you to wash them clean in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. So before I let you go, I gotta ask if there's anybody here today that would say, Bill, that is me. I am exhausted carrying the burden of my sin. I'm exhausted trying to make myself good enough to be saved. And I'm ready to put my confidence in Jesus alone as my Savior. And I'm ready to do it right now to say, Jesus, take my sin and wash it away and take the rest of my life and show me now how to live for you. And if that's you, I just want to ask you to raise your hand before we pray together and close our service. Anybody that would say today, yeah, that's me, and I am ready. God bless you. Way over here. Yeah, right over here. God bless you. In the pink shirt. Yeah, God bless you. Anybody else that would say it's me? I'm ready. I want to give Jesus what's left of my life. Ask him to save me. Make me clean. God bless you, sir. Yeah, amen. He's going to do something new and powerful in you right now. Anybody else? Jesus said he wasn't ashamed to go to the cross for us. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of this. Open your heart and say, yeah, I want, I want salvation. I want to be free. If that's you, one more call, one more call. Anybody else today that would say, now is the time. Right back there. God bless you. Ready. He's ready. He's ready to take you. Anyone else? Ready to say yes to Jesus? Right here. God bless you, man. I'm so excited for you. So excited for you. Right on. Okay. I know there's some of you that you tremble at the thought of even raising your hand. Right back there. God bless you, man. Yes, amen. Okay. It's not so much the raised hand as it is the open heart that says, I'm giving what's left of me to you, Jesus. I've messed it up long enough, and I'm ready to give it to you. So if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with the congregation, with me right now, and let's just say this to God. The words aren't magic. The connection is your heart to him. And he says, I will in no way cast out anyone who comes to me. So let's say this to God, okay? Let's pray this way together. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus Christ who who was sent to earth to die for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. And Father, I have sinned. And I am done trying to fix my life and make myself good enough. Jesus, would you forgive me? Take over my life and wash my soul clean and help me to live for you. You have what's left of me. I'm yours. 
in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand in a second, but those of you who just, in a very, very personal way, just made a very focused commitment of your life to Jesus, whether it's the first time or just this coming back to Christ, would you stand first? We want to applaud you and personally welcome you. God bless you and you and over there. Yeah. Woo! Thank you, Father. Amen. Now let's all stand. Let's all stand. Welcome home. Welcome home to the family of God. Now, if you saw somebody stand, you got to go give them a fist bump, a handshake, or a bear hug, a brother hug, before they get out of here and welcome them to the family. But let's sing what's going to become our theme song here at Refuge, okay? Let's sing this out loud. Here we go. Can I encourage you, say that, sing that a lot. From now, oh, until Jesus takes you home. Find yourself day in and day out just saying, Lord, I love you. Thank you for the beautiful sunrise. I thank you for my salvation. Thank you for being the lover of my soul, the strength within me. Lord, I love you for those things. I love you, Lord, for my family. I love you for my church. I just love you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done. Prayer teams here, they would love to pray with you over whatever's going on, sickness, difficulty, challenges, whatever that might be. Prayer room, uh, communion is going to be served right away. And grace and peace upon you in the strong name of Jesus. Let's go serve him. God bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.